Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And the first thing is thank you so much for all the great birthday wishes. I got a lot of flowers as you can see and good wishes on Facebook and emails and um, it was a wonderful special day. And my beautiful cat Schroeder sent me flowers and also um, bought me a kitty book to read to him a kitty coloring book and a kitty night shirt um, that says cat people on it. He's such a thoughtful cat. So I had a wonderful birthday and I really thank all of you so much for sharing in my happy day. Um, some announcements as I usually start on Tuesday. Um, conference is next week and a um, couple spots left. Uh, we are filming it for those of you who can't join us and um, uh, the conference videos will cover the main sessions, almost all the breakouts and the Sunday afternoon vaccine panel. And along that line, I just want to say a little bit about vaccines. Um, we're covering a book right now, an advanced study called the HPV Vaccine on Trial. It's a big book, thick book, has an enormous amount of information written by a couple of attorneys and uh, an author, co-author. And uh, we've had two classes, we're gonna have two more. The material is highly disturbing. I, I said when I picked up the book, I knew, I would assume that I would know a lot of the stuff that's in the book and I'm already pretty disillusioned with medicine and the FDA and the drug companies and so many other things. I really didn't think I was gonna be shocked, but I'm more shocked than I believed, could, ever could have believed about the information in this book. And we're gonna end up having a couple of more classes on it. And the reason I bring that up is I'm creating a course on vaccines. And the reason I felt that it is so important to create a really good evidence-based course on vaccines with handouts and things of that nature is that uh, I'm pretty clear on the idea that religious exemptions are gonna start going away. They already have in several states and they're gonna go after them in all states, which means that the discussion about vaccines is gonna to have to go to a new scientific level where you, parents and interested people, are gonna to have to be able to say to a school, to discuss this with a doctor, to discuss this with an elected official based on the science, not on preservation of religious freedom. So this is one of the 10 new courses I'm gonna offer next year. I'm gonna teach it early in the year, probably toward the end of January, beginning of February. In addition to that one, we're gonna offer cardiovascular disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, cancer 201, kidney disease, Parkinson's, ALS, food allergies, and contraceptive options for contraception options for uh, women. And so um, those of you who are coming to conference are getting a $500 coupon gift, gift card, if you will, from, uh, from us toward any of these courses or packages. Um, it is almost to the end of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We have gotten so many pledges in here. I am so proud of our company and all of you. Um, we've been entering them in our system like mad people. And remember, if you sign a breast cancer pledge, you get a $100 certificate and access to a free online lecture about how to prevent breast cancer. So if you're interested in any of these things, please uh, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. And keep those inquiries about careers coming too. You know, we offer the, uh, a full di a diploma program that is the equivalent of a dietetics degree, the way that people would like to take dietetics. We have many other training programs. Um, send me an email, we'll chat about it. All right, some things from viewers that I wanna cover. One thing is, and I totally understand that it's the thing that has caused us to be in business and to grow the way that we have, is all of the confusion that arises from, uh, from studies. People don't know how to read studies. They don't understand how to interpret them. And a couple of recent um, study uh, video clips, one on choline and uh, the one on that red and processed meat study that supposedly showed that you can eat red and processed meat and it doesn't reduce your risk and people don't wanna stop doing it anyway. Well, anyway, hopefully one of the things that you learned is that uh, from listening to that is also the true information um, uh, behind those articles, but also um, the fact that when you really start looking into this stuff, um, you find an entirely different um, uh, conclusion often uh, than the one that is that's getting all the headlines. And so, um, some of you have asked me to disclose, like, what are some of the most important things to look for when you look at a study? The first thing that I'll tell you that I think is very important when you're evaluating information is to get away from the he said, she said, my neighbor said, and I've got a neighbor, and you read a book, and I read a book, and this website, and that website, and really do focus on reading research and studies. 
Um, the most obvious one is conflicts of interest. And in the study on red and processed meat, there were a lot of conflicts of interest there, including even the journal acknowledging that they weren't really being very diligent about it. Another thing is study design, including selection bias. And this happens often where the study is really, it starts with the idea that instead of a curiosity to find out the answer to a question, the study is structured to um, provide a predetermined answer to the question, and that's an entirely different thing. So if you're conducting a study, for example, or a literature review, to see what the effect of red and processed meat is, that's one thing. If the purpose of the review is to show that eating red meat and processed meat is okay, oh my gosh, that's an entirely different thing. And you can pick some of that stuff up in the way that the study is designed. They're often maneuvered to show a particular result from the get-go. The length of follow-up time. I, I'm astounded at the number of studies that say that you can eat fat and it won't increase your cancer risk and the follow-up time is 90 days. You know, it, to develop cancer as a result of bad dietary decisions can take 10 or 20 or even more years than that. So to pronounce that anything, even at the end of a year, would um, reduce the risk of cancer or increase the risk of cancer is, is ridiculous. More follow-up time required. And by the way, that's one of the things in the HPV book um, and all the, the, the research, if you could even call it that, on the HPV vaccine that has been a problem is the fact that the HPV vaccine is being represented as a, um, as a vaccine that prevents cervical cancer. It doesn't. And the clinical trials were too short. I mean, cervical cancer is a disease that develops in older women. It takes a really long time to develop. So pronouncing nine-year-olds um, as being inoculated against cancer is just ridiculous on its face. Um, establishment in a cause of a cause and effect relationship, not just a correlation. All the nonsense about vitamin D, which really isn't a vitamin, is based on observations where somebody says, Sick people have low vitamin D levels. That's an observation. That, that says nothing about whether or not low vitamin D levels cause sickness. And as it turns out, that's not the case. And taking vitamin D doesn't prevent sickness and it doesn't help people recover from sickness. So having a cause and effect relationship. I use a couple of examples that I took from Colin Campbell because I think they're just wonderful. One of them is when you're looking at cause and effect relationship um, versus correlation is if you were to look at countries in which women are getting more driving privileges, like in Saudi Arabia, there's something else going on too, and it is that women are getting more breast cancer. Well, gosh, maybe driving is the cause of breast cancer. So we'll just take all the driver's licenses away from women and we'll tell some of these Middle Eastern countries they were right all along not to let women drive. Now, that's a great example. And I think Dr. Campbell picked it for a reason because it's so obvious. But, um, but much more subtle um, examples exist all the time where people look at an observation, they see a correlation, they infer a cause and effect relationship when one has not been established. And I think if we did some research, we would find out why the breast cancer rate is going up in Saudi Arabia. And it really does not have anything to do with the, um, the driving privileges given to women. Um, serious limitations of, associated with self-reported data, particularly when you look at research on nutrition, so much of the information is self-reported and people are notoriously inaccurate at reporting what they eat, particularly when they're asked to look back on the previous year and answer questions like, how many times do you think you ate berries last year? I'm pretty aware of what I eat and I don't have a clue, all right? So that's a limitation. Uh, the extent to which research findings have been replicated. Um, is there something actually meaningful going on here? I mean, the fact that you change a biomarker doesn't mean that you're changing health. And the most obvious or biggest example of that that people understand is you can shrink a tumor and not extend a person's life by a single day in terms of cancer if you don't address the underlying cause. And then relying on the preponderance of the evidence instead of a single study. There's a, you can find a study in the medical literature that will prove anything or show anything that you want to talk about. Support any point you want to make. That really doesn't tell you anything. It's what does the majority of the research actually show. So um, you asked for some guidelines. These are some guidelines. If you still don't know what to do, sign up and take our programs, take our course. I teach one called Research and Writing every year. It starts at the end of February. I only do it once a year because it's a very labor intensive course to teach, but 
Um, you might want to think about that and include it as one of your uh, courses in a package that you buy from us if you decide that you're going to pursue some education with us. All right, so another topic, I guess the two big topics for today are, my gosh, how do I make sense out of the information I'm looking at? And the second thing uh, that I want to talk about is diet and depression in young adults. Um, and I'll just start by saying this, it is crystal clear that depression is not a biological disease, it's not a chemical imbalance in the brain, that's not what causes it. Um, that's what the drug companies and the medical profession, the psychiatry profession has, um, has uh, invented. I mean, really, out of thin air, this was an invented theory. It has no validity whatsoever. But it is equally clear that a person's overall state of health can contribute to the person's mood, depression, and anxiety, and, and that sort of thing. People who eat a poor diet, who are dehydrated and sedentary, they sometimes find it difficult to feel positive about life when they feel physically awful. And I remember a time when I felt physically awful, and I don't think I was depressed, but I didn't really have a whole lot of energy to get up and go every morning and get something done. Thus, several studies have shown a relationship between diet and depression in both adolescents and adults. A new study shows that even moderate dietary changes with limited support can make a difference in psychological state. Depressed subjects between the ages of 17 and 35 were randomized to a diet change group or an habitual diet group and followed for three weeks. Now, I just talked about um, short time of follow-up, and um, this would be an example of something you have to be careful you don't make too much out of it, but there is a lot more research to support this than just this one study. Well, anyway, those in the diet change group were given dietary instructions from a dietitian via a 13-minute video which was available to be watched again if the subjects decided that they wanted to do that. The diet was frankly not all that great, but most likely better than what people were eating before they enrolled in this study. Participants were told to increase their consumption of vegetables, at least five servings per day, fruit, two to three servings, protein from either animal or plant sources, three servings a day, unsweetened dairy, whole grains, uh, whole grain cereals, fish three times a week, nuts and seeds uh, three tablespoons per day, olive oil, and seasonings such as turmeric and cinnamon. Now, this is not a diet that resembles ours. I mean, it's more plant-based than most. But as I mentioned, I think it is probably significantly better than what these people were eating before they enrolled in this trial. Now, one major limitation was um, there was a lot that they used self-reported data which can be inaccurate, as you heard me just talk about. However, the recollection was only for the immediate um, period of time. Uh, during the three-week time of the study, it wasn't for, you know, tell us how many times you eat melon in the course of a year, or about how many servings of vegetables do you eat every day in a very general sense. Another thing is that carotenoid levels were measured as a means of determining if people were eating uh, more fruits and vegetables or not. The researchers reported a significant reduction in depression in the dietary intervention group and no changes in the habitual diet group. The dietary intervention group also showed significantly lower anxiety and stress scores um, as compared to the habitual diet group. Now there are known mechanisms. This is one of the things that gives this study some um, validity. Uh, there are known mechanisms of action for how diet can improve mental state. Eating foods high in resistant starch like oats, rice, legumes, and potatoes has been shown to increase production of something called gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA in the gut. The gut microbiome actually does this. You never thought of your gut microbiome as a Xanax ma ma manufacturer, but that's kind of what it is. Anti-anxiety medications like Xanax, by the way, target the GABA signaling system. Serotonin, a neurotransmitter involved in regulation of mood and behavior, is produced mostly in the gut by enterochromaffin cells, which are influenced by metabolites produced from foods like whole grains and vegetables. So we do have, and I'm just giving you a, a, a couple of things. Uh, one of the courses we offer here is food, exercise, and mental health. And there's a lot more detail about this type of thing. So this study is one of many that I've looked at. People who are clinically depressed and chronically anxious, I'll say this, usually need some form of therapy. But I think that the ther my experience has been that the therapy is a lot more effective when combined with eating well, exercising, getting hydrated. I think for one thing, people feel better when they take better care of themselves. And there's no question that a better diet, exercise, hydration makes people feel, uh, feel better. So it leads to 
um, uh, more efficacy when people engage in therapy. So um, one of the reasons I picked this study, since I already had so many, is if you can show people a 13 minute video, tell them to eat a diet that's not really that great, but better than what they were doing before, and three weeks later, things are already better. Think what would happen if you were really feeling terribly from a psychological standpoint, or somebody you knew was feeling terribly, and you, um, you ate an optimal diet, and you lost weight, and you exercised, and you uh, got some therapy, you did, you did all the right things, and you made a much bigger dietary change, and think about the type of change that you might notice in your mental state, psychological state, in two years, three years, four years, five years. I mean, we've had people who basically say, I think I feel better now, meaning a few years after doing this than I probably ever felt in my whole life. And, um, and I can say that I was never depressed, but you know, I, t I started changing my diet when I was 38 years old. And uh, fortunately, I, was, I, was, um, I didn't have some dreadful disease. Unfortunately, I was pretty fat and not, not healthy at all. But I, re I realized someplace along the line a few years down after I had changed my diet, my lifestyle habits and that sort of thing that in my uh, early 40s back then, I actually felt better than I had ever felt at any other age, including my adolescent years in my life. And isn't it amazing that a person can feel better at 42 than they did at 17? All right, well, I hope that this is helpful, and I hope that these guidelines for looking at information will point you in the right direction. Um, take our courses if you don't get it yourself, but at least these guidelines will help you to start asking the right questions about the things that you're seeing. And if you are suffering from depression or anxiety or any psychological state, get the right type of therapy, and there is a right type of therapy, and take good care of yourself, and life can be much better. All right, hit the subscribe button as usual. If you haven't, uh, um, uh, if you're not a subscriber, make sure that you do that so you can get notifications when we uh, post new videos. And as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.